This video is an in-depth commentary on Earthbound. So much of the magic of Earthbound comes from experiencing the little details for yourself, so if you have any interest in playing the game, I recommend doing so before watching this video. We have a lot of ground to cover, so without further ado, let's get started. Earthbound hit American shelves in 1995 on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Until the 2015 release of its predecessor, Earthbound Beginnings, it was the only game in the series to see an official English release. I'm going to be looking at Earthbound independently of Mother 1, because until very recently, it was English-speaking audiences' first and only encounter with Shigesato Itoi's acclaimed Mother series. Now, Shigesato Itoi himself is not exactly a game designer by profession. Aside from the Mother series, he's only made one other game, a fishing game. He's primarily occupied as a writer, specifically famous for being a copywriter. He actually wrote the advertising material for quite a few Studio Ghibli movies. He also runs his own somewhat popular online newspaper. But he doesn't just write, either. If you've ever seen the Japanese version of My Neighbor Totoro, he voices the father in that movie. He even writes song lyrics for pop songs. He's a jack-of-all-trades, a renaissance man, and a celebrity. But, but, brutal compounder, this is a video about Earthbound, not about Shige Sako Miyazaki. Well, what I think sets Earthbound primarily apart from other games is its sense of perspective, and that perspective, I think, is a direct byproduct of its creator's broad pool of experience with life. Earthbound makes a lot of really simple but on-point observations about the way people act, the things that they say, what the world has to offer, what life's all about, that kind of thing. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start where any good story should. The beginning. A few things worth mentioning about this character naming screen. You actually name every character you're ever going to control in the course of the game. You name Ness, but you also name his companions, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh. Now you haven't met these guys yet, but this serves as sort of a primer. It's getting you excited for all the people you're going to get to meet over the course of this globetrotting journey across a goofy world. This part also nudges you toward injecting a little bit of yourself and your home life into the game. The game asks you for your favorite food, it asks you to name your pet, and it asks you to name your favorite thing. That's what you're going to draw power from as your psychic ability in Earthbound when you finally earn it. And whenever you choose to visit home, which you can do at any point in Earthbound, your mom will whip up your favorite food to just give you a little taste of home. But because I have no friends, and because all I like is pizza, I'm going to be rolling with most of the defaults. Wow. One fateful night in 1990X, Ness is awoken by a mad ruckus outside. His mom and his little sister Tracy are scared, so naturally Ness steps up to the plate to go check out what's going on. But not before changing out of his jammies, of course. Now the cops are about as in control of the situation as you'd expect adults in an RPG to be, which is not at all. They're basically just milling around pretending to know what to do. Now one of the cops asks us a question about this chunky kid over here, Pokey. Is he our friend? Now, the choice has no practical consequences, but it does say something about who we are. From our limited interaction with him, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy I'd want to hang out with. But that said, I was raised to give people the benefit of the doubt, and I think Ness was too. Now, this doesn't actually matter. Really, what you're choosing here, is Ness going to be a compassionate boy, or is he going to be a little bit cheeky? Either way, things play out the same, but it's an important difference, and it changes your color of your view of the game. Because the police are blocking the crash site where the meteor landed, we have to go back home. But we don't get much rest until we're awoken by, quote, the most annoying knock in the world. It's Pokey. Now, Pokey here is trying to get our help finding his little brother, who apparently ran off. He condescends to our mom here, which immediately should leave a bad taste in your mouth. I don't know if any of you have heard of or seen the old show Leave It to Beaver. But there's a character in there named Eddie Haskell, and Eddie Haskell is the all-American good boy who will do or say whatever he needs to to get what he wants, but around his friends, he's a total ass. That's sort of who Pokey is, or at least who he is at the beginning of the game. We'll follow him as Earthbound progresses, but essentially we're going to be following Ness's development into a thoughtful, open person with knowledge of the world and also track Pokey's development into a myopic moral failure. Heading outside, we get into our first combat encounters. Now, there's not all that much to the combat in Earthbound anyway, but that's especially apparent now when really all we can do is hit the attack button and wait for the fights to be over. 
Now, while the combat is as bog standard as it gets at this point, it does excel above other RPGs in the flavor text used in battle. Now, keep in mind, this was not a very common feature of RPGs back then. You see, we had Final Fantasy VI, or III as it was known as in the States, Secret of Mana, Dragon Quest, that kind of game. Those games had functional battle text. They explained what was happening, to who, how much damage was being dealt, what status ailments were in play. They delivered information, that was the purpose of the text. In Earthbound, well, one of the most memorable parts of this journey up the mountain isn't any item that we find or enemy that we encounter. It's how once in a while Pokey will do something like apologize to the enemy or get scared. It's easy to forget in our modern world of Undertales and Lisas that RPGs weren't always doing creative funny things like this. They played it a lot straighter. Earthbound shook the entire genre up for the better. Anyway, it turns out it was not Picky who ran away from Pokey, but the other way around. Typical cowardly Pokey. Anyway, when we get to the top, a buzzing creature appropriately named Buzz Buzz emerges from the meteor to deliver a shitload of exposition to us. Now, Earthbound's story is fantastic. Earthbound's plot, on the other hand, is about what you would expect. There's an important distinction there, whereas the story is more the ultimate point or the arc that the characters in the game will take, the plot is the series of events that will occur, and the plot is pretty standard. There's an evil bad guy named Gygus who's going to destroy the world in the future, and it's up to us to collect eight things so that we can stop him. I think this is actually a little bit of parody here, because one of my least favorite parts, and I imagine many others' least favorite parts of RPGs, are the exposition dumps. And who better to deliver an exposition dump than an intentionally annoying character named Buzz Buzz who constantly goes buzz, 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 buzz. But he more than makes up for that by putting us on his back when we get jumped by the Starman Jr. when we descend the mountain. Makes it all the more tragic when Buzz Buzz is brutally murdered in a second. Anyway, we return Pokey and Picky back home, and their father promptly goes upstairs to beat the hell out of him. In the Japanese version, it was a little clearer that what was going on was beating. They censored it a bit in the American version, they changed the sound effect, but the sound was more explicitly violent in the original. We also learn a bit more about the home that produced Pokey here. His father tells us that our family owes him $100,000. This was more explicitly a lie in the original Japanese. The translation was closer to a kajillion dollars. It was clearly false. With a swift swing of her flabby arm, Pokey's mom, Lardna, that's really her name, takes Buzz Buzz out. Rest his soul. Or at least rest his soul after he gives us some more exposition. Of course. He basically tells us that we're going to be going around the world looking for the eight pieces of our song. That's all we need to know right now. With that, we're ready to leave the house and greet a new day. I really like that moment, how the music rises up in sync as the scene fades in today. What better way to go off to the races and kick our journey off? And one of the most important parts of any journey are the memories that you form along the way. The photo man, the self-proclaimed photographic genius, is one way that Earthbound makes those memories literal. Let's think about it, what's the point of taking photographs in real life? You're capturing a moment in time so that you can go back and reflect on it later. Reflection is one of Earthbound's primary themes, so it's only fitting that someone will snap photos of us as we encounter key moments or maybe even just little distractions on our journey. The photo ops in Earthbound are opportunities for the game to remind you to keep in mind what it is you're doing, where you've come from, and where you're going. Not just in the game, but in real life. It's a little premature to get that meta, but the game goes there. We'll revisit later. Now, one of the things you'll notice as you stroll into Annette is that unlike the vast majority of RPGs, there's no clear delineation between the town and the overworld. It's all just one continuous place. You walk in and there's enemies running through the streets. There's enemies near and in the arcade. So not only does this eliminate any traditional concept of an overworld, it also keeps you on your toes. Earthbound makes it clear that you could encounter enemies anywhere you go. Anything could be around the next corner or in the next area. And that's a good sense of wonder for a game to instill, especially in an RPG that's all about exploring a big world. Now, if you start chatting up the locals of Annette, you'll notice that the adults in this game tend to be missing some change between the ears there. I think that adds to the feeling of being out on your own on a big quest. It's up to you and your friends to save the day, not mom and dad or the cops. Further to that lack of help, the mayor won't give us the key to the sanctuary until we deal with his gang problem, a gang set up shop in the arcade. 
After taking on dozens of pogo stickers and skateboard punks, we are able to face our first boss, Frank, an older man who probably shouldn't be hanging out with a bunch of kids in an arcade. Now it's no secret that Earthbound can take some dark turns once in a while, and this is one of the first instances of that. I just think it's really funny that a grown man is attacking a little boy in a back alley with knives. Naturally, the mayor is happy that we took care of his gang problem, and he's willing to give us the key to the giant step cave. However, he makes us promise that he, a grown adult who runs a town, will not be held responsible if he's sending a child to his death right now. Now, the giant step cave is the first real challenge that the player encounters, and unfortunately, it reveals some of the shortcomings with the battle system right up front. For starters, things are very boring at this stage. There's only one party member, Ness, and all we can really do is hit the bash button, or once we level up a bit, use his one psychic ability. Until we get some more party members, things are going to be a bit tedious, and the combat is at its worst at the beginning of the game for sure. Still though, Earthbound's combat is still pretty interesting compared to RPGs of the time. They had a nice feature where if you were clearly overleveled for an enemy, you wouldn't even have to sit through the fight. It'll just immediately end and you'll get a sliver of experience. There's also the unique and strange rolling health meter. The idea is that when you get hit for damage, you don't lose all of that health immediately. Instead, your health starts ticking down in front of your eyes, and if, say, a fatal blow is struck, then you may be able to heal yourself before your health actually hits zero, saving you. Trouble is, the health ticks down so quickly that you're not even going to notice this most of the time. It really only comes into play later in the game, and even then, it's subtle. So when we get to the end of the giant step dungeon, we face off against our first sanctuary guardian, the Titanic Ant. Yeah, so Earthbound technically has boss battles, but they're never all that interesting. They go down with some pretty straightforward combat, and for the most part, they're just big animals. There are some exceptions, but the boss battles are not highlights in Earthbound. But while the Sanctuary Guardians are nothing special, the Sanctuaries themselves certainly are. They're little anomalies that we find, just strange features of the land that cause you to reflect on how it got there and what its place in the world is. These memorable locations cause Ness to turn his thoughts inward. Here, he reflects on a vision of a small, cute puppy. But our dog King isn't a puppy, he's an old mutt with an attitude problem, which means that we're actually seeing a vision from the past. So as you move forward in Earthbound's globetrotting checklist of these sanctuaries, you're really finding new interesting places and meeting new interesting people, and all of those new experiences with life cause you to turn your thoughts back to the past. And again, reflection is one of Earthbound's key themes. When we finally come outside, the cops are pissed that we upstage them. Think about it, Ness rolls through town, cleans up the town's gang problem within minutes, Curry's favor with the mayor, and then proceeds to brave the strongest challenge the area around Annette has to offer. The cops look like jackasses, and they want theirs. So naturally, they take Ness into the back room so they can beat the hell out of him with billy clubs. I don't know what's funnier here, that there's grown men beating the shit out of a little kid because their pride was wounded, or that they managed to somehow fail at that. It's, it's a good scene. Tucson is a different place from Annette, and it marks Ness's first time really venturing away from home. Visually, it's different, the leaves are starting to change, it's more of an autumn-type place. It's more developed, it has a bicycle shop, a department store, a hotel, a theater for live music. As the game goes on, Ness is going to visit locations that are more and more unfamiliar, but this first step away from home is an exciting place that shows how big the world is beyond Ness's hometown. When you fall asleep in the hotel in Tucson, Paula reaches out to you via PSI in your dreams. We talk to Paula's father and the local town thief, and learn that Paula's been kidnapped by a crazy group of cultists and hauled off to a cabin in the woods. Now that's a problem, because we named Paula, we know her, and the preschoolers like her. She's a nice girl, we gotta help her out. But unfortunately, the path is blocked by a big iron pencil, which means we're gonna have to make some friends. There's two local inventors, Apple Kid and Orange Kid. Apple Kid is cutting edge, kind of stinky, kind of fat, but he knows his stuff. He's dedicated to the craft and art of invention, and he makes exactly the tool you need to get through. Meanwhile, Orange Kid is devoted to figuring out a way to unboil an egg. Yeah. Fortunately, the pencil eraser erases the pencil and opens the path. Unfortunately, that path is Peaceful Rest Valley perhaps the most annoying area in the entire goddamn game. Now, I've already mentioned several times that Earthbound's strong suit is not its combat, but the combat is still genuinely fine through the course of the game, except at the beginning. 
The beginning is where it's weakest, and that's for a number of reasons. For one, there's just less for you to do. There's fewer options to pick, there's fewer ways that your powers and abilities and attacks can work together with the rest of your parties. It just doesn't have that complexity to make it interesting at the start. Second, because you don't have the healing abilities of your teammates, and because it's early on and you're not likely to have many healing items, you have to rely on the RNG a lot more in this first part of the game than you do later on. And in this area, Peaceful Rest Valley, egregiously so. I mean, it's just ridiculous. This area is extremely long, it's winding, it has multiple paths with little collectibles. It all sounds great, but when you factor in that enemies are constantly randomly spawning and moving all around and there's basically no way to avoid them whatsoever using the intended methods of the game, you wind up having an area that is never any fun to play through, at least not for me. This area is almost irredeemable, and I mean almost, because oh my god, it is completely redeemed by this one enemy, the Territorial Oak. Look at that smile! Look at what? This oak is so territorial that he uses psychic abilities to shock your brain. And he's the most formidable enemy in the area. And when you beat him, he explodes into flames like a suicide bomber and wrecks your shit. And honestly, when I think of this area between the tedium, the unengaging combat, all of that, when I think of this area, I just think of that tree. So they did something right. We emerge from the Valley of the Shadow of Death into Happy Happy Village, which is a town taken over by a cultist group called the Happy Happiest. They're a great parody of the cult mentality. They have everyone in the town singularly devoted to the mission of turning the world blue. They paint everything blue, they make the cows blue, they wear blue clothes, they want everything to be blue. And like any good cult, they have their charismatic leader in Mr. Carpenter. Carpainter, whatever. This asshole's keeping Paula locked up in a cabin, and apparently he can control lightning. But thankfully, Paula has an item that can help us here, the Franklin Badge. It's an item that reflects lightning. It's funny how an item with such a humble beginning, its purpose is to reflect lightning against this one guy who uses lightning. That item winds up precipitating one of the most devastatingly tragic scenes in Mother 3. And speaking of Mother 3, Pokey, what is actually behind the Happy Happiest somehow? He's working with them to lock Paula up? This guy just graduated from neighborhood asshole to genuine psychopath criminal. But I don't think that captures it all. Really, to Pokey, this is all just mischief. He's just messing with his friend, Ness. He's having some fun. He's just... He's just messing around. No, no harm, no foul. This is one of the fundamental underpinnings of Pokey's character. Because of his upbringing, or who he is, or a combination of both, he is unable to connect with people on an empathetic level. He doesn't understand the impact that his actions have, and he is unable to feel what others would feel. He is not able to be a human. So we take care of Carpainter, and it turns out he was under the thrall of the statue that he was worshipping. The Manny Manny statue. That'll come up later in the game, but it seems to be the embodiment of a seductive kind of evil. It called to him and made him do peculiar things. And that's true, it really did make him. As soon as you beat him and free him of the many, many statues control, he gives you the key to free Paula, his cult disperses, happy happy village goes back to being normal. Really, the statue is a material force of evil in the world. On a philosophical level, this is important. Thomas Aquinas, as a devout Catholic, believed that there was no such thing as true, substantial evil. That evil was not a real thing that was created at any point. But instead, he argued that it was simply a lack of the good. That it was us turning our way from the light and the good of God. In Earthbound, the metaphysics are a direct counterpoint to that. There is a genuine substantial, real, pure kind of evil that exists on a deep, godly, metaphysical level, and it rears its head as we go through our story. This is the first time it shows its face though, so I wanted to point it out. With Paula in our party, we're well equipped enough to take on the next Sanctuary Guardian. The formula is the same here as the Giant Step, but it's a lot more tolerable thanks to the second party member. So with Paula's help, we clear the dungeon and face off against our second Sanctuary Guardian, the Mondo Mole. Yeah, 
I don't have much to say about this guy. He's a big mole. So instead, I'll take this opportunity to talk about one of the more memorable features of Earthbound's battles, the backgrounds. The standard approach in RPGs is when you begin a battle, you enter a sort of abstracted representation of the environment that you're in. If you're in a grassy field, then you'll enter a battle and you'll see a generic field plains backdrop. Or if you're in a cave, you'll go into the battle and you'll see a generic cave backdrop. Earthbound is very different in this way. Its backgrounds are made up of two layers, each with their own variations on color, distortion effects, and patterning. The end result is that no two backgrounds are exactly the same, and all of them are trippy and memorable. Well, maybe not memorable on their own. I don't remember this particular background as some great thing. But taken on the whole, these backgrounds add a great deal of texture to the battles in this game. So we defeat the mole and make it to our second sanctuary, the Lilliput Steps. This is just a little mysterious set of tracks from one tree to another in the forest. It gives us one more phrase of our personal song and grants us a brief vision of a baby wearing a red cap. This is another flashback to Ness's past, and I really like this one because the red cap is one of Ness's iconic features, and it's cute that he also had it as a baby. It's always been his thing. Now even though we've got the sanctuary, we're not ready to continue on the next leg of our quest. That's because the tunnel that connects Tucson to the next town, Threed, is filled with spooky ghosts. And the only indication of a ride we can hitch is the Runaway Five's tour bus at the north end of town. The Runaway Five, the coolest cats in all of Earthbound. These jazz masters make the stage their own. They are gods of the groove. But they're not so good with money. They're always finding themselves indentured to different club and theater owners across the world of Earthbound. And in this case, at the Chaos Theater in Tucson, they're in the hole for $10,000. So are they worth saving? Let's find out. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's smooth. That's some smooth, smooth grooves. Oh. Oh! Oh my god! So, we get 10,000 bucks from the town thief, free the boys from their indentured servitude at the Chaos Theater, and hitch a ride to our next destination, Threed. Threed marks a hard left turn for the tone of the game. It's a considerably darker area than both Onet and Tucson, and I don't mean dark in a creepypasta kind of way, I mean dark in a Halloween jack-o'-lantern kind of way. The town is overrun with zombies and ghouls, so the townspeople have taken refuge inside the circus tent in the town square. We poke around trying to figure out what's going on, but find no leads except for a scantily clad young broad who we're told we should spend some time with. Hell yeah. So we follow her into her hotel room for some sweet, sweet lovin'. <laughs> this is gonna be so sick. <laughs> I can't wait to smash me some of that. Oh! Oh no! It was secretly a trap. So Ness gets jumped by some zombies. We wake up buried alive. The zombies do not mess around. So Ness and Paula are sealed in an underground vault with no hope of escape. The door is locked, so what will they do? Well, naturally, Paula is going to do exactly what she did the last time she was trapped with no hope of escape. Reach out for help, psychically. And just like that, we cut to somewhere completely different. A snow-covered alpine forest appropriately named Winters. Winters is home to an academy for gifted boys. It's at this boarding house that we meet Jeff, the third good kid involved in the fate of the world in Gygus. There's a few things to say about the winter section of the game. The first is that it's an unexpected change in playable character. You switch abruptly from Ness and Paula to Jeff a world away. Jeff himself is the neglected son of genius inventor and scientist Dr. Andonuts. Jeff's an inventor as well, and we're introduced to this fact through some light puzzle solving where we use gadgets to open lockers. Okay, yeah, speaking of the lockers, this is where I noticed Earthbound's single biggest problem the inventory. Managing items in this game sucks. It is so bad, it is aged terribly, and is the least enjoyable part of the entire game. Just dealing with your inventory, selecting items, using them, equipping them, it is so sluggish and cumbersome. Earthbound is aged well in almost every way, 
but there are a few parts of it, inventory is one, combat's another, where it definitely feels its age. And uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say, but I wish they did the inventory better. Tony's farewell to his best friend and roommate Jeff is so funny to me. It's so over the top and emotional. I don't know where you're going and why, but remember, we're best friends forever. This game is able to wring a lot of comedy out of some simple sprite animations and sharply written text. This game is just very weird overall. This is the bubble monkey. He likes bubble gum, so we give him some gum and then he comes with us. So anyway, the two of us on our Christmas adventure across the frozen tundra of winters. We're on our way to our father's house, Dr. Andonuts. Along the way, we'll ride the big fat pink head of Tessie, the Loch Tess monster. On the other side of the lake, we find the stupidest dungeon ever devised. It's a series of straight corridors. The enemies we encounter are mad ducks and worthless protoplasms. We then meet the man responsible for this dungeon. His name's Brick Road. He's devoted his entire life to making dungeons. And uh, wow, A for effort, uh, good, good luck. Anyway, there's a lot of combat after this point, not much to say about that. One thing worth noting is that you pass by one of the sanctuaries that you'll encounter later in the game. Anyway, Bubble Monkey's done his duty and goes off to be with the goily of his dreams. I'm gonna take this opportunity to address the humor in Earthbound. It's always hard to explain why something is funny. In Earthbound's case, what makes it a funny game? It certainly has a reputation for being one, and I'd say that reputation is well earned. But why? What does it do that makes it funny? I think that there are two key characteristics to the humor in Earthbound. There's a lot more that goes into it, but there are two things that make it consistently funny in my opinion. The first is all the characters utterly lack self-awareness when they speak. So, oh Jeff, you're my son. It's been maybe 10 years since I last saw you. I'm so glad you're a healthy boy. Jeez, thanks dad. The second key feature of this game's humor is the absurdity of everything. You mix that with the bumbling idiocy that we were just talking about, and you have the charming package that we know and love today. In general, Earthbound doesn't have a single sarcastic bone in its body. It's totally earnest all the way through, and it's really hard to communicate in a video like this just how endearing the game can be. It's something you have to experience for yourself. On our way to go save Paula and Ness, we get sneak peeks from the air at what the rest of the world of Earthbound has to offer. A city, a desert. This world is big and it all feels connected. We saw the whole trip beginning to end. Jeff crash lands in the cemetery, destroying the Skyrunner in the process, but he has just what we need to get the hell out of here, a bad key machine. So we break free and asking around town, we find out that the leader of the zombies is strong because he always eats peanut butter and fly honey sandwiches. Yeah, it's just one of those earthbound things along with the tent with a big angry face that wants to kill us. Conveniently, shortly after this, we get a call from Apple Kid, who's got just the hookup we need. Zombie paper. It's like fly paper, but for zombies. We lay our clever trap, and one by one, all the zombies around town converge on the circus tent. We notice also that two zombies who were blocking a ladder are now moved. Come morning, the zombies are good and dealt with, so we can go down that ladder and see where it leads. We follow it into a secret passageway that's dark and winding and scary. Everything in here is a zombie, so we must be on the right track. We fight a mini boss named Mini Barf. Not much to say about him, but he's gross and he gives a hint at what the final boss of this area is going to be. When we emerge, an old man tells us that there's a place with lots of interesting people up ahead. Saturn Valley. Let's check it out. Saturn Valley is one of the strangest areas in the entire game, and that's really saying something for Earthbound. Saturn Valley is home to a toddling race of well-intentioned little guys who speak in broken English. Everything about the Mr. Saturns is silly. From the way they look, the things that they say, the Mr. Saturn-shaped houses that they live in, and the Mr. Saturn-themed appliances that they use within. You hear that bumbling, stumbling tune? Yeah, that plays through the entirety of this area, and it's great. Then, maybe most memorably, there's the way that the Mr. Saturns talk. The Saturn's dialogue deserves to be commended for how strong a sense of sound it's able to communicate just through its font. When you read this, how does it sound in your head? How would this character deliver this line? 
If I were a casting director trying to find a voice for Mr. Saturn, this text alone would tell me to look for someone loud, foreign, energetic, and cute. The Saturn's dialogue has a memorable sound to it in this way. While the voice that you might be imagining for Mr. Saturn right now may be very different from the voice that I'm imagining, the font ensures that you're still hearing something vividly when you read the text. Now this font was actually more important to this game than you might assume. For the original Japanese version of the game, the game's director, Shigesato Itoi, designed the font himself. It was that important. I know it may sound silly to call something small like that important, or you may question why Itoi found it necessary to design it himself and make it just right. But you have to keep in mind that a game like Earthbound, unlike many, many other RPGs, it's not about the big epic story moments. It's about the little moments along the way that make you smile. That's a critical facet of this game, and it's done very, very well here with the way the Saturns talk. Now the layout of Saturn Valley is a sharp departure from the design of Earthbound's other towns and cities that we've seen so far. From the unfinished ladders that pepper the landscape, to a cave filled with garbage and a pointless ledge, and uh, some kind of pen keeping a mad duck. Uh, you, you can't do anything with it, he's just kind of there. Functionally though, Saturn Valley is just as useful to you still as any other town. Maybe more so because you can stay at its hotel free of charge. Everything about this place, the design of the area, the ability to heal for free, the Mr. Saturns themselves and everything that they have to say, they make this an area that you like and want to come back to. Anyway, back on the main track, the whole reason we came to Saturn Valley was to get some intel on where to find the mastermind behind the invasion of zombies in Threed. We learned that the password to their secret base is to stand motionless behind this waterfall for three minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's earthbound. I don't have much to say about the dungeon itself, it's just kind of an industrial complex, but I will give the game credit for being more lively with the addition of Jeff to your party. It's a lot more interesting when you have three party members who can bounce skills off of each other and... The combat's never great, but it is appreciated that it gets better as the game goes on. This is Master Belch. He is responsible for the zombies. I'm not quite sure what the connection is between these big blobs of puke and zombies and ghosts. I don't really care though. Master Belch is a memorable villain. He enslaves the Mr. Saturns, which is sad but also funny and he's gross. He belches with this very realistic sample for a Super Nintendo game uh, once in a while as he talks. And this is as good a time as any to talk about the status ailments in this game. So Master Belch right here is belching at our party and it makes Paula feel nauseous. Nausea is one of the status ailments you can get. You can also catch a cold, you can start crying, or my personal favorite is you can get homesick. If Ness doesn't call his mother often enough at the game's many telephones in the drugstores, then he'll feel homesick and will be unable to fight. He'll just start crying and miss his mom. The only way to cure this ailment is to go to a telephone and give your mom a call so that she can tell you everything's gonna be okay. Maybe let you know what your sister's been up to. Just remind you of that connection to home. You're out in the world, but you aren't cut off from where you came from. That's very important in this game. Ness draws his energy to push on, not from some mystical pool of anime power, but from his connections to people, his family, his mother in particular, the series is called that for a reason. As far as the resources go, where do you get money? You don't find treasure chests full of gold or shake enemies down for their spare change. Your dad deposits money in your bank account so you can pull it out at the ATM. That's what this game is all about. The little stuff, the real world stuff. Whoops, says I was waxing poetic. Turns out, Gygus was able to smuggle a Manny Manny statue into Foreside, the big city in the world of Earthbound. Speaking of Gygus, it's about time we talk about the game's antagonist. Everything we know about Gygus at this point suggests that he's some kind of generic alien monster. I mean, what, with the very first screen when you boot up the game being a 1950s B-movie, looks like a screenshot ripped directly from Attack of the 50-Foot Aliens or something, to our encounter with the Starman at the beginning of the game with that classic Day the Earth Stood Still look. Which catches us up to what we just did, defeat a belching blob monster from outer space who raises zombies from the grave to attack a town full of circus people. All this considered, who Gygus' servants are, what were presented as being the war on Gygus, 
Gygus is silly. He's a big, dumb alien. And that simplicity is critical to Earthbound's ultimate bait and switch. We need to believe that this is a straightforward quest to stop a straightforward villain. Now, in reality, it's anything but, but we don't know that. Now, before we head back to 3, there's a sanctuary hidden in the depths of Saturn Valley, Milky Well. Before we head there, we're offered a cup of coffee. And when we take a sip, we're presented with the most Earthbound scene in all of Earthbound. It's a trippy, casual reflection on everything that you've accomplished up to this point in your journey. This is many players' favorite part of the game, and for good reason. Now, there's a lot to dig into here. First, let's notice that the narrator, whoever is telling us about the events of our quest, is addressing Ness in the second person as you. Now, as I mentioned at the very start of this video, it's important for Earthbound to involve you as the player directly. Now, this is not how Ness's character is handled in the vast majority of the game. Normally, you're looking at Ness from a top-down point of view, detached. He never says a word, we never know what he's thinking, and we have no indication that he's anything other than a vehicle for the player's inputs, at least not until this coffee break. Here, the map, the player sprite, the characters, the Mr. Saturns, it all fades out. It's just you and the game. The game is inviting you here to look at Ness's journey as your journey. Not that you need convincing of this, you've already invested probably a dozen hours of your own time into his adventure at this point. Even though the game already has you, it still takes this opportunity to confidently assert that it is not an experience just to be breezed through. It's something to be chewed on, something to be thought about and remembered. Now, I don't think Etoy, or I'm sorry, our narrator, cares so much if we reflect on the game itself. This is the attitude that the game wants us to have toward life. You leave home, you experience the world and take it into yourself, and you return home better for it. Then, after reflecting, the narrator asks us to think about the future, what we're about to go up against. It'll be more difficult than anything we've undergone to this point, but he knows we'll be alright. The game has earnest faith that we'll be able to complete it. So, that stuff aside, where does the coffee break fit into Earthbound's larger story? I mean, it's so bafflingly unique that it feels like a major turning point, and I think that it is, but we don't get anything material out of the coffee break. Just as a contrasting example, let's look at Ocarina of Time. In Ocarina of Time, you complete the first three dungeons in the game, the Deku Tree, the Dodongo's Cavern, and Jabu Jabu's Belly. After all this, you're granted the Master Sword, a powerful weapon that lets you face the rest of the game confidently with courage. The coffee break gives you no such literal gift. Instead, it offers you a spiritual one. The gift that we receive after clearing the first three areas of the game, Annette, Tucson, and Threed, an obvious pun on numbers if you didn't catch it already, what we're given is a new sense of perspective, a mandate to look at the rest of the game in a different way, to reflect as we experience it. To close, the game offers Ness, Paula, and Jeff, and by extension, the player, the ultimate gift. He wishes us good luck. And with that, we're on our way to the rest of our journey. So we beat this big pile of shit and claim our next sanctuary, the Milky Well. Now the text at all the sanctuaries in the game is well done, but this is one of my favorites. At Milky Well, Ness recalls a memory of his mother. From far away, she said, be a thoughtful, strong boy. I mean, through all the questing in the world, can you really hope to become anything greater than that? Anyway, time to head back. I realize I haven't pointed this out before, but once you clear a sanctuary out, all the enemies that bothered you on the way there start to run away from you. It's a small touch, but it really feels like you've claimed it as your own. This is your place now, and the enemies know it. Okay, so with three finally cleared of zombies, the buses are running again, and we can head on to our next destination, Foreside. To get there, we just need to cross the Dusty Dunes Desert. Should be simple enough, the bus is gassed up and ready to go. Yes, sir, any second now we'll be rolling up on the big metropolis of Forside. <sighs> problems. Always, always problems. So, a traffic jam is blocking the road to Forside, so we'll have to cross the whole desert to make it there. This is a cool area for a few reasons. One, there's a status ailment that you can only get in this and a different desert in the game called Sunstroke. You need a cool towel to cool yourself off and cure this particular status ailment. I also just love the music in this place. Earthbound's music is top-notch. It's my favorite on the Super Nintendo and one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. 
But my personal preferences aside, one thing that nobody can deny this game is how creative its music is. Just listen to this track, it's a combination of a lazy Mexican riff with surreal alien warped beeps and bloops and hums. We already heard from when Master Belch was burping at us that the game uses samples, real-world recorded samples, not just synthesized electronic sounds. The game even samples popular music. Don't believe me? Let's listen to a few. Monty Python, the flying Earthbound soundtrack was innovative, to understate things, especially for a game originally released in 1994 for the Super Nintendo. In fact, to fit all of the game's music onto a Super Nintendo cartridge, they had to upgrade from the standard 8 megabit Super Nintendo cart to a supersized 24 megabit cart. You may be inclined to ask why Nintendo went to such lengths for this game, but then recall that Shigesato Itoi's profile in Japan extends far beyond video games. It's almost like having a celebrity developer on board. Anyway, after we cross the desert, we find a cabin near a construction site. Inside, we can rest and wait until morning for the traffic jam to clear. And with that, we're off to Foreside. Foreside is substantially more developed than anywhere we've been to this point in the game. The modern looking bridge we have to cross to get into the city demonstrates this pretty well. Earthbound's world is sort of a vague approximation of what a Japanese person imagines America to be like, and Foreside is New York City. Or you know, close enough. The skyscrapers are a colossal change from the architecture that we've been seeing in the other towns of the game. Foresight really gives the impression that you're far, far away from home in the big city. It's different, very different, from the other towns that we visited. The first time that you come here, you're likely to just wander around aimlessly for 20 minutes trying to figure out where the hell everything is. The scale of this place is overwhelming, and that's definitely the point. Thankfully, there are safeguards in place to make sure you don't get too lost. The department store is closed as of now, and we can't get into the Monotoli building yet. Both of these facts serve as a little hint of where we'll have to go later, too. One of the few places we can go now is the Topola Theater, a pun on the famous Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. Here we find out that, once again, the Runaway Five are in money trouble, this time in the hole for a million dollars. But wait a minute, didn't the people at the construction site in the desert say they were building a gold mine? Sounds promising. When we return, they finish their work and we can finally enter the mine. Predictably, it's full of monsters now, but not just any monsters. Five big moles. And these moles are the funniest enemies in the whole game. All of them insist that they are the third strongest mole in the hole. They all give speeches about it too. No, really, I'm the third strongest mole. My strength falls between the second and fourth strongest moles. And then I'm the third strongest mole of the hole. So look, you fought the strongest mole in the hole, the second strongest mole in the hole, the fourth strongest hole in the hole, and the mole in the mole, and the weakest mole. But I, the final mole, am the third strongest hole of the mole. Even the backgrounds all say number three while you fight them. Like I said before, most of the humor in Earthbound is more make you smile than make you laugh kind of humor, but this sequence just slays me every time. So, we clear the place out, and now it's safe for the foreman to start mining. 
Heading back to Foreside, we're stopped on the bridge by the foreman's brother in a bulldozer. He's nice enough to give us a little kickback for our help. He wasn't able to find any gold, but he was able to procure a diamond. The diamond is worth more than enough for the owner of the Topola to let the Runaway Five out of their debt. Once set free, we're finally able to explore the Foreside department store. Now, if you've been following this sequence of events, it may seem pretty arbitrary. It is. Following the chain of logic from after we realized the Runaway Five would need money and that the gold mine would be a good place to visit, we had to clear the mine out, leave, and then expect to be given a reward, not at the mine, but on the way back to Foreside, and then expect that only after freeing the Runaway Five, that would trigger the department store to open. I don't follow. But the department store scene itself is pretty fun. We explore the place, just going shopping like normal, then on our way out, the lights cut out, and Paula is abducted by a weird googly moogly tentacled alien. As I mentioned in the on at section of this video, one of the cool parts about Earthbound is that there's not a real separation between the overworld and the rest of the map. Enemies can be encountered in the world at large, running through the streets of town, or in this case, in a place that we would expect to be safe, a department store. So we beat the department store spook, but it looks like he's already smuggled Paula off to the Monotoli building. Inside, who do we find but Pokey, living large? It seems like he's been just as active being an asshole as we have being a hero. Now, what is he doing in Foresight exactly? Well, probably the same thing that he was doing back in Happy Happy Village. Recall that the Manny Manny statue is what caused Carpainter and the cultists to kidnap Paula and ruin the town in the first place. Awfully suspicious now, Belch told us that the Manny Manny statue had been moved to Foreside, and look who shows up, Pokey. The statue itself is a representation of physical manifest evil, and it's no accident that it and Pokey seem to be two birds of a feather. There's not much we can do here, Pokey's goons force us out, and so we need to think of a plan. Running around town looking for leads will eventually lead us to the cafe, a bar in the original Japanese version of the game. All mentions of alcohol were scrubbed out in favor of coffee in the English version. After learning that Mr. Monatoli is a regular at the cafe, we leave to find Everdread, the thief back from Tucson, lying hurt in the street. He's been beaten and left for dead by Monatoli's goons, and he tells us that we should check behind the counter of the cafe if we want to know what's going on with the Manny Manny statue and Monatoli. Before he passes on to the next life, Everdread leaves us with a haiku poem. When on your way out, be sure that you say goodbye, then lock the door tight. Tragic. For the first time in Earthbound, the stakes have gotten mortal and real. Pokey, Monotoli, Gygus, they are willing to go to any lengths to... Oh. Uh, Everdread, he's, uh, he's walking away. He's, uh, he's why just... He's fine, he's uh, motherfucker. Inspecting behind the counter leads us to another dimension entirely where everything is screwed up. Topsy turvy, inside out and backwards, whatever you want to call it, this is not, not an okay place. Not normal, no, no, no. There's many weird places in Earthbound, but Moonside is the first batshit, off the wall, completely out of control environment. This is very intentional, it's meant to be unsettling and completely impossible to make sense of. Let's take how you navigate this place. You find weird dudes wearing sunglasses and Hawaiian shirts and they teleport you around, seemingly at random, until you finally end up where you need to be. The enemies are more abstract than they ever have been, I mean literally you get attacked by abstract art. The colors are out of control, the townspeople, or crude facsimiles of them, chant and babble to themselves in weird tongues. Listen to the sound that plays when you sleep at the hotel. What an awful, off-kilter rendition of that classic jingle. This place, Moonside, is a distortion of Foreside. It's a place that should not exist. And sure enough, what do we find in the center of town but the Manny Manny statue, again. You see, unlike the relative goofiness of the happy happiest cult who wear pajamas and paint cows blue, here, the Manny Manny statue is latched onto the collective consciousness of an entire metropolis. Mm, does that sound uh, familiar to anybody, huh? No? Okay. I don't want to overinterpret what's going on here. On its most basic level, Moonside is just a weird backwards world where up is down, left is right, yes is no. But by this point, it should be becoming clear that the Manny Manny statue is not just a mystical artifact or some evil god. It's somehow related to people. It's related to a distortion in people. 
I need to pause for a second because we're being followed by an invisible man with a golden tooth who can help get us to the Manny Manny statue. Anyway, the Manny Manny statue shows up when something is going wrong within the hearts of people. In Happy Happy Village, it was Carpainter starting a cult and kidnapping a young girl. In Foresight, it's Monatoli. He's taken a tyrannical control over the town and ordered the police to rule with an iron fist. And as this statue blazes a trail of chaos, who follows behind it every step of the way? Pokey, Ness's rival. It makes sense that an embodiment of evil like this would go hand in hand with a boy whose heart is fundamentally misaligned with the world. So we bust up the statue and Moonside dissolves into a simple warehouse in the back of the bar. Well, sorry, the cafe. The mouse tells us that the whole time we were in Moonside, we were really just wandering around the warehouse with a vacant, faraway look in our eyes. Disturbing. I'm gonna do a blow-by-blow blow here because this series of events is so arbitrary and dumb that it's just charming. First, we get a call from Applekay, the inventor back in Tucson. He tells us he invented a gourmet yogurt machine, but the only problem is it can only make trout-flavored yogurt right now. He's having the machine delivered to us via Escargo Express's neglected class. Okay. So we leave the cafe and a monkey crashes into the wall and turns scorched black. We have a chat with him, and he tells us that Talo Rama, whoever that is, has just finished fasting. He lives in a hole in a desert with a bunch of monkeys in it. Alright, so far so good. The monkey delivers his message and quickly teleports away. Next, this separate dumbass crashes into us, and judging by the onomatopoeia in the text box, continues to flop and flail into us after he's made contact. So this guy also tells us about a hole in the desert full of monkeys. A sunbathing dude told him about it. And of course, true to form, neglected class has forgotten our package in the desert. <sighs> At least it's clear where we need to go. Asshole. This character is a great stab at terrible customer service. I'm not going back that way. Don't ask me to get it. It's your package, right? So you go get it. Maybe that thing I forgot is important to you. So bye bye. But wait, there's more. This rapid fire bullshit train has not ended yet. A maid comes up, Pokey's maid to be specific, and she needs special trout flavored yogurt for Pokey. How convenient! Boy howdy, do we have a solution for her! That this all happens in the span of, like, a minute is really funny to me. Now what is not so funny to me is the item management hell that we're forced through when we go into the monkey cave. This part of the game is bad for all the same reasons that the Gibdo well in Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is. In a game whose weakest feature is its inventory management, I don't know why they decided to put an entire stretch of gameplay where you're just flipping through your inventory, giving monkeys the correct item, clearing out space in your inventory to pick up the correct item, swapping them out, moving through the damn menus. It's terrible. And of course, there's going to be a couple of items that you have to go get. Maybe you don't have the pizza that you need, so you got to order that and wait for it to arrive. It's just not fun. Maybe that was the point. Maybe this was all just a big elaborate scam poking fun at these fetch quests in different RPGs. I don't care. I don't like this part. So what is our reward for going through all of this tedium? Well, it's actually pretty good. On top of getting the trout-flavored yogurt maker that we've been told Pokey needs, we are also taught by one of the sage's apprentice monkeys how to teleport, and this skill is so useful. It almost makes the previous section worth it. So, how does teleportation work in Earthbound? Well, for one, I'm glad that they introduce it when they do. Up to this point, you've been taking normal means of transportation to get around. You've walked from town to town, you've taken buses on occasion, and in general, it takes time to get from one point to another in a world that's this big. So teleportation is a huge boon to us now. We've seen a lot of the world, and we've done it on foot, or by car, or by bus. So to be able to warp around at this point is certainly welcome. Second, I like how the teleportation actually works. It is not as simple as selecting a destination from a fast travel menu. To be able to teleport, at least at first, we need enough space to really get a running start, almost like the DeLorean from Back to the Future reaching 88 miles an hour. You need a solid stretch of road to do that, and it's fitting that you're taught the technique on a long stretch of road. I guess I just appreciate how the teleportation is a more physical part of the world than just an option in a menu, and that's certainly appreciated after all the menu fiddling we had to do to get the skill in the first place. So, teleportation definitely cuts our commute back to Foreside down. We give the maid the rancid trout-flavored yogurt dispenser, and that gives us the blessing we need to go visit Monatoli on the top floor. I like how the robot bodyguard gives us a full 10 seconds to enter the secret code. Not like we know it, we just have to wait for it to count down, and here we go. Battle. 
So, after winding through a series of hallways and rooms, we encountered the ultimate bodyguard of the Monotoli building. This tiny, dinky robot. The clumsy robot. Now, don't let his name mislead you. While he is clumsy, he is also invincible! Now, as usual, Earthbound's combat is at its best when it's cracking jokes. I love how the clumsy robot will do actions like wanting to go get a battery. Now this battle goes on and on, and it feels like it'll never end. It's just Ness and Jeff here. The possibility of dying is very real. But, just when things are at their darkest, the Runaway Five finally helping us for a change. The execution of this moment is pretty interesting due to Earthbound's combat system's limitations. We're really only ever in combat seeing the enemy and the background and the text boxes with our party's names in it. So when a friendly group comes in to help us, how does the game communicate that? It may be too easy to miss if it was just told in text at the top of the screen. So it works out well that the people who save us are the Runaway Five, musicians. So when they come in, their classic song that they play on stage that we've seen twice to this point starts playing. It's a great way to illustrate what's going on without the use of visuals. With the robot out of the way, we're able to walk into the next room and save Paula. Who's there but Mr. Monotoli, cowering? Look at his skinny arms, his thin body, and his gray hair. Just as was the case with Carpenter in Happy Happy Village, none of this was the desire of Mr. Monotoli. It was all done at the urging of the Manny Manny statue. Mr. Monotoli would never do something like this, but of course, the Manny Manny and Pokey would. Pokey and the statue suck the life out of Monotoli and the city because that's what evil does. Well, I don't know about you, I'm not about to let Pokey get away with this, so... oh. And there he goes. Before he zips off to parts unknown again, Pokey takes one last opportunity to mock Ness, call him a pinhead, and say that he has no use for Monotoli anymore, so it's pointless to hang around. This is just reinforcing what we already know, that Pokey, Gygus, the Manny Manny, whatever, bundle them together. They're one step ahead of Ness, and we're playing catch up. Now let's actually back the tape up here to look at the helicopter, specifically the lettering on it that says heli. You'll notice that it's a mirror image of the word, it's reversed. You'll notice this in lots of old games, it was a memory saving measure, and of course you'll notice it all over Earthbound 2. It's the difference between storing two different sprites for this one helicopter in the storage, or just mirroring the same one. Half the storage. Now most of the time this isn't a problem because character sprites and most other enemy sprites are symmetrical. If you flip them around you don't really notice, but when there's writing involved it becomes clear. My question is why put the word heli on the helicopter at all? I mean we know what it is, it took off from a big pad with an H on it, it has a propeller, it flies. Why introduce the error at all? Whatever, it's not a big deal. So Monotoli told us that we were going to have to go to the resort town Summers in order to proceed on our quest. He saw this in a vision when he was under the many many statues control. When we talk to Monotoli again, he issues an unintentionally pointed remark of concern for Pokey. He took the helicopter, I hope he's okay. Physically, yes, for now. Spiritually, developmentally, morally, no. He's been deteriorating since the beginning of the game. Recall at the beginning when he was just a bully or a mean, annoying kid in our neighborhood coward, to now he's reveling in his greed, hurting people, kidnapping people, and he's just getting sucked farther and farther down this rabbit hole of evil with the Manny Manny statue. Now of course the statue is literally exerting control over people's minds and it is creating distortions and illusions and all that, but it operates on a subtler level too. Pokey is failing in his development as a good thoughtful person, and that statue drawing him in symbolizes that. Another thing worth noting about the statue while we're on the subject is that Ness is not immune to its influence. We saw as much when we got sucked into the imaginary world of Moonside. It's not like Pokey and everyone else is bad and Ness is good, so therefore the statue affects some people and not others. Everyone is susceptible to its call, and that's going to come up again later. So the Runaway 5 gives us a ride back to Threed. We're going to use the Skyrunner to get to Summers, but before we can do that, we have to modify it to be able to reach that far. To do that, we need to fly all the way back to Winter so that Dr. Andonuts can work on it for us. Now we fly back using the same path that Jeff took when he was on his way to rescue Ness and Paula. What's the difference here? Well, nothing except that we're flying in the other direction. What's the importance of that? Well, remember, once again, that one of Earthbound's key themes is reflection. This scene is one of the many opportunities that Earthbound gives the player to reflect on what they've done. When we were Jeff flying on our way to rescue Ness and Paula, we got a glimpse of everywhere that we were about to see. We saw a massive sweeping desert, a huge sprawling metropolis. Now we've been there, we've done that, 
and we get to see it again as we head on to the next leg of our adventure. So after we land at Dr. Ananas' lab at Stonehenge, we get to head back into the caves where we saw that sanctuary as Jeff earlier that we couldn't access, and finally take it head on as Ness and the gang. I said before that the sanctuary guardians aren't all that memorable, this is an exception. This is Shroom! Oh, excuse me, I meant this is SHROOM! <laughs> Other than that, not much to say here. Just think it's funny that there's an exclamation point like that in his name for no good reason. And what adds to the joke here is that the battle text will sometimes put an exclamation point like, Oh yeah, uh, Jeff filed the big battle rocket! Exclamation point. When it does it with Shroom, it says, Ness did 86 damage to SHROOM! Now this might actually be one of those things that had more impact in the original Japanese. Shigesato Itoi's inspiration for creating Mother One in the first place was the fun that he had playing Dragon Quest. And playing Dragon Quest, he narrated the game out loud as he played it. Like, yes, the hero strikes for 28 damage! And he got really into it that way, and he wanted fans to have the same experience playing his games. So, if there's an exclamation point like that, maybe there's a reason. Maybe he did intend for there to be some obnoxious, loud quality to this character's name. The Sanctuary, Rainy Circle, gives us a whiff of our favorite food. You may notice it says steak here. That's the default. I lost some footage while making this video. I am not going to apologize. It's a long ass thing. Uh, but anyway, like all the other Sanctuary locations, this is a nice little reflection on an important moment or part of Ness's life and past. Before we head off in the newly modified Skyrunner, Dr. Andonuts gives us the important information that Jeff wets his bed sometimes, but otherwise is a good kid. He wants us to take care of him. Well, that's probably as close to a heartwarming farewell we're going to get from Dr. Andonuts. Actually, it's been 10 years since he's seen Jeff. I doubt he wets the bed anymore. But it's the thought that counts! With those well wishes in our pockets, we load up into the newly modified Skyrunner and jet our way over to Summers. You know, this place looks really nice. We got some nice boats out there on the water, a pier, a nice beach, some umbrellas, some sunbathers, a hot chick in a bikini. Man, it seems like everything is great except for the Skyrunner. Once again, predictably, it crashes and burns in a fiery mess. The unreliability of Dr. Andonut's creations is funny for now, Maybe terrifying later, we'll get to that, but we can see that the Skyrunner is destroyed beyond any repair. There's nothing left of it. At least we have that monkey training that taught us how to teleport. We can wander around town for a little bit now. As the name implies, Summers is a summer resort. Everybody's relaxing on the beach, there's a hotel, it's a very touristy kind of place. And as we lazily get acquainted with our surroundings, we get a phone call from Tony, Jeff's friend from his boarding school up in Winters. And he asks us a question that blows the lid off this whole game. I'm collecting players' names for a school project. You know, players just like you. That's right, you, the one holding the controller. Would you register your name, please? Don't spell your name wrong. Remember how the coffee break from earlier referenced us in the second person as you? Well, now the game has made this completely explicit. We, the people holding the controller, are referenced directly, and our name is requested. What for, we don't know yet. But the fact is, there's a reason the game wants to know who we are. Not Ness, not Paula, not Jeff, not Pooh. Us. So the game reaches out to us and we confirm who we are, then we get another comically dramatic goodbye from Tony. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Oh, no, I'm really hanging up this time. Next up is Club Stoic, where one of the sailor's wives is hanging out all day with a bunch of pretentious pricks. I imagine that this part of the game flew over most kids' heads as they were playing it, as it's a parody of snobby, pretentious people. Oh, you guys can't envision the final collapse of capitalism? Incredible! Mm -hmm. I think it's a very complicated issue. <sighs> oh, <laughs> sorry, I was sleeping. I finally awaken the inner me, my true self. The patrons of this club are able to stare into their own soul hard enough to burn a hole in their psyche. I'm now comfortable enough to stare at the real me, the true self, and burn the impression into my superego. I want to be in this comfort zone anytime, all the time, or at no time. My id is telling me, what? What? Magic cake? You came all this way just to eat my magic cake? This is the sailor's wife. She invites us to go out to her cart by the beach so that we can try some of this cake. She tells us that the cake is made of all 
all leftover materials and is very special. And oh my god! Ness had a dream. It was a very clear and very strange dream. Jesus, what was in that cake? We are whisked a world away again, much in the same way we were when we took control of Jeff in Winters, to the far off land of Dalam and into the shoes of Pooh, the crown prince of this eastern kingdom. Pooh is undergoing the final leg of his training and has one last trial to endure. He used to go to the place of emptiness to take this test. Normally, you call your father as Ness to save the game, but when Pooh interacts with this phone-headed man, he calls Ness's dad still, and is asked if he's disguising his voice. Oh well, not a big deal to Ness's dad. Need a sense of humor at a time like this. Thanks, Dad. Looks like neither Andonuts or Ness's father are very present father figures. We can walk around Dalam a bit and see that Prince Pooh is apparently a ladies' man. When we've had our fill of poking around, we meet up with our master at the base of a mountain and climb up to undergo the final leg of our training. Moo. Emptiness. Nothingness. After Pooh meditates for a bit, we're greeted with this masterpiece of a sequence. The world fades out and is swallowed up in horrific static and darkness. Then this disembodied ghoulish old man head engages us in a kind of battle. He's the spirit of our ancient lineage. He tells us he's going to break our legs. Holy shit, that's brutal. This spirit tears us limb from limb. He rips our arms off and feeds them to the crows. Our health reaches zero. He describes how all we can do is lie there while he cuts our ears off. We don't mind if our hearing is taken from us, do we? Yes, accept it. As he severs our ears from our head, the sound cuts out from the game. With no legs, no arms, and no sound, what else does he have to take from us but our sight? Do you care if I take your eyes? Do you want to live in eternal darkness? I shall steal your sight. Do you accept it? Yes. Cut to black. At this point, what else do we have that he can take from us? He can only communicate directly through our mind, but... Oh, our mind. In the end, I will take your mind. But you don't want to allow that, do you? You can't move? Can you answer? Are you sad? Are you lonely? If you lose your mind, you might also lose any feelings of sadness. Do you accept that? I will take your mind, Pooh. Know that I will possess it. And we're back. Jesus Christ, that scene is so good. For one, it's a massive departure from the tone of the rest of the game. Extremely dark, violent, he rips us limb from limb and we experience it in the first person. He takes our eyes, our ears, and our very minds. And then there's, there's the great second aspect to this, which is we listen to that dumb sailor's wife in the cafe, the stoic club, tell us about, ooh, the mysteries of ego death and the super ego and the id and seeing one's true self. What better way to demonstrate the stupid pretense of all that than to give you the real deal, to take you through an actual spiritual undoing and reformation. We talk to our father who tells us that we have a role to play in the greatest struggle of all time. We learn a new teleportation ability, Teleport Beta, which eliminates the need for that DeLorean-style ramp up to 88 miles an hour, and Teleport to Ness in Summers. Now that Pooh is in our party, we're able to read the hieroglyphs in the museum in Summers, and we get a cryptic warning about Gygus. This is our first hint that Gygus is anything more than just a big evil alien guy. He and his army are invaders from beyond space and time, beyond the dark, beyond the lost underworld, beyond the deep darkness. That's foreboding, to say the least. Anyway, the museum curator in Foresight gives this museum curator a call and says he's found something interesting at his place. So, time to go back to Foresight. So let's do that now. Going back to Foresight's museum, we can talk to some people, get our picture taken. You know, it's a real shame that I can't show you every single line of dialogue in the game because it's all very good, and it was all written by Shigesato Itoi personally. He's really the only writer that was involved in this game. This, though, is one of my favorite jokes, personally. HUGE! 
Not you, I'm talking about the dinosaur bones. <laughs> now the curator of the museum won't let us under the place until we get an autograph from Venus. Venus is the swanky broad who sung alongside the Runaway Five in a concert that we saw earlier. Now, all the little stage performances in Earthbound are charming because they're working with so little and they have to sell a live performance. They use some of the same tricks in the Runaway Five performances earlier in the game. They have the spotlights on the performers in the foreground, and they have them doing a little jig, a dance, swaying in and out, crossing each other, that kind of choreography. Now, the reason I bring all this up now, as opposed to in the earlier performance scenes, is because they add one additional element to the the show that really just seals the deal. They have this MIDI instrument that honestly does sound like a seductive, raspy female singer. It's well done. They do a great job with the music in this game, even for the stuff that doesn't really seem like it should matter all that much. But like that instrument and like the stage shows in general, they just do that much more to add to Earthbound's world feeling alive and real and populated with real people. That there are people going out to the theater to listen to live music and we get to see it ourselves really makes Foresight feel like a city. So we get our autograph and a little smooch for the road and are able to go under the museum. Now, as usual, I don't really have anything to say about the dungeon leading up to the sanctuary here. It's a stretch of sewer, and you fight a bunch of rats and cockroaches, and that's basically it. So I guess I'll take this opportunity to talk about why you might choose to go to this sanctuary before going to Scaraba. I mean, both are valid options that you can take. Only problem is that to get to Scaraba, we have to cross the ocean, and along the way, we get attacked by a kraken. So players might attempt to do that, get crushed, and then decide to go somewhere else. The Sanctuary Guardian du jour is the Plague Rat of Doom. He is a big rat with the plague. As always, the Sanctuary itself outshines the combat leading up to it. This time, Ness gets another glimpse back in time. He sees a baby's bottle for just an instant. This next bit is completely optional, so there's no real good time to bring it up, but it's so good that I have to mention it. At the beginning of the game, if we walk to the southwest side of Onnet, we can find a cliffside facing the sea. There, there's a bit of oceanfront property on sale for $7,500. Now at that point in the game, that's a shit ton of money. We don't have anywhere close to $7,500 when we began. We're dealing with double digit sums of money. But now that we've come a good chunk of the way through the game, we've got poo in our party, our dad keeps giving us more and more in our bank account, we can finally afford this place. So, $7,500 down the tube for this house. Better be good. You couldn't see, you couldn't see the backside of the house from the map. It, it, it didn't exist. You know, I did think that $7,500 was pretty cheap for a house in retrospect. Just to add insult to injury here, the photo man spins down from the ceiling to take our picture in front of this masterpiece of a home. This is one of my personal favorite moments in the entire game. Now you may be thinking, oh, a funny joke, but do you get anything for this? Well, well, yeah. Not anything that'll help you, but certainly something interesting. In the dresser drawer, we find a short story written by Shigesato Itoi. My Secret Life, Chapter 3. I was neither a murder suspect nor a target for an international spy organization, but I drove a car down the Jersey Turnpike at 80 miles an hour. A police officer pulled me over and asked for my driver's license. He said I was going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. I instantly pointed to my wife and said, I'm in a hurry! My wife is in labor! Fortunately, my wife actually had a big stomach. I hoped he let me go with this excuse. Oh, since it's an emergency, I'll lead you to the hospital with my police car, he said. No, it's not necessary. Why not? asked the officer. Uh, well, let's get going, said the officer. No, no, we can't! This baby is a demon child! I don't know how else to describe the writing in this game than cute. It's it's just adorable. Anyway, back at the Magnet Hill Sanctuary in Forside, we picked up the Carrot Key. That allows us to warp back to Pooh's homeland and clear out some rabbit-shaped statues that were blocking our entrance to a cave. We got more combat here, but I will throw the game a bone. Earlier I mentioned that the game's combat suffered for being boring due to a lack of complexity with limited party members. Now that we have Pooh on our team, we're running on all cylinders. The combat's never great in Earthbound, but at this point, it's good. This dungeon in particular is noteworthy for its super freaky enemy designs. So we teach the Sanctuary Guardian, Thunder and Storm, that Thunder and Lightning ain't so frightening. And we emerge at the other end to Pink Cloud, our next sanctuary. The atmosphere here and the visual design is very serene, and I love it. This time, Ness actually sees a vision of his mother when she was young. 
There must have been a time when she was Ness's age, going on an adventure of her own maybe. Now this will be one of the few times that I bring Mother 1 up. Some people have theorized that Ness's father is actually Ninten from the first game. That may be true, it may be not. Point is, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that everybody in this world, this mother universe more broadly, they used to be young, they used to have dreams, they went on a journey of growth, and that's how they ended up who they are today. In the case of Ness's mom, she must have come from somewhere, Ness must have come from somewhere, and when he visits this location, he starts to think about that. We already know that Earthbound has a vested interest in turning a mirror to the player, so when you think about what this means in the context of the real world, paradoxically, self-reflection is not all about thinking about yourself. It's about thinking of the world that you're a part of, where you came from, and what the bigger picture is, what matters. Family is certainly one of those things. So it's only natural that at one of these points of reflection in the game, we think about Ness's family. Then, of course, there's just that added bit of weight that necessarily comes from any reference to motherhood in this, the second game in the Mother series. At this point, I'd say we're ready to cross the ocean and head to Scaraba, where we'll be attacked by a kraken along the way. Now, this kraken was hyped out by the people in the seaside town of Summers for a while. The little village is actually called Toto, and the sailors there all tell stories about the horrors of the kraken. Now, you can attempt this journey quite a bit earlier, but you'll probably be beaten to a pulp by the kraken. Hypothetically, you can make this journey earlier. If you're able to beat this thing, then you can go to Scaraba. But really, you probably shouldn't be doing this until after Pink Cloud. It was after I arrived in Scaraba that I realized that even by today's standards, Earthbound has a lot of content and varied locations to visit. We don't even stay in this town for very long, but it's complete with its own theme, its own architecture, and a complete set of new NPC sprites. Now, if you're a naysayer, then you may bring up a quality over quantity argument that sure, Earthbound has a lot of different places to go, but none of them are that particularly deep. But keep in mind what Earthbound is actually going for. It's meant to be an exploration of the world. In this way, Earthbound actually strikes its depth by packing itself to the gills with interesting people, places, and things to see. A little aside here, if we walk to the east of town, we can find Pokey's rancid shit. The farther along we come, the more and more he seems like a cancer on everything good in the world. So we have to do some light puzzle solving in order to get into the pyramid to continue on. I think it's creative that the hieroglyphs on the walls animate and attack our party. It's one of the more creative enemy designs in my opinion. When we emerge through the underground passages in the pyramids to another landmass, Pooh's master shows up again to whisk him off to learn the art of Starstorm. Now, I was actually introduced to Earthbound, like I imagine most people in the United States were, through Super Smash Bros. And if you recall from Super Smash Bros. Brawl, PK Starstorm is Ness's final smash, and it's a pretty flashy, audacious move. So you can only imagine my excitement when I found out that we were going to get this ability. It's still a real bummer to lose Pooh here, though, because he's already carved out his own role in our party at this point. He has many useful offensive and healing abilities, so losing him's a drag. That said, I think there's a point for doing this. Just like when we lost Paula in the mall back in Foreside, the game makes you notice the value that your friends have by shining a spotlight on the hole that their absence leaves. Anyway, in this chunk of desert, we find a very strange looking tower. We use a key that one of the natives gives us, and inside, we find some signs. Some familiar signs. Welcome, you're inside of my body. Brick Road. Yeah, this is the same brick road that we met back in Winters who designed that terrible dungeon. He's finally realized his dream of becoming Dungeon Man. This place is hilarious. It's full of self-conscious signs that over-explain the choices that went into designing the dungeon in the way that it was eventually put together. It's a great piece of satire on how video games are made. Most of the dungeons in Earthbound, and most other games, are designed to be in-universe obstacles for our heroes to overcome. But the implicit assumption in a video game is that no matter how large or grave an in-universe threat is, it's a challenge made by game designers for players in the real world to experience and complete. While it's really funny to have Brick Road demonstrate to us all the strings that allow his massive dungeon or, or body, I guess they're one and the same at this point, to stand up, but really, those strings are in place in any video game that we play. The designers construct it in a way that it's completable by human beings, and they make conscious decisions to guide us in certain directions, evoke certain responses, and in most cases, prevent us from getting frustrated. This whole section of Earthbound is a very well-constructed, self-contained poke at how video games are made. I love this. And speaking of stuff that I love, Dungeon Man is just the gift that keeps on giving. He agrees to follow us around for a little while, and he just waddles behind us while this hilarious music plays. 
He's not just for show, he actually helps us in battle. Once in a while, he'll do a tremendous amount of physical damage to the enemies, which is great. He's able to follow us as far as the southern tip of this peninsula when <laughs> he gets stuck in the trees because he's too big. Ness, it makes me sad, but I must say goodbye here. This is my eternal resting place. Now, my native tells us that the deep darkness is right on the other side of the river. That's one of the places referenced in the prophecy that Pooh read back at the museum in Summers. Mysteriously, the river separating the gap is described as bottomless, and we'll need a submarine to cross it. Thankfully, Dungeon Man, the ultimate bro, a man's man, true and to the end, has exactly the hookup we need. And so we set off, and we travel so far by submarine that the water's color even changes. The amount of distance that you travel in Earthbound is huge. There's a lot that Earthbound excels at, but one of the things it absolutely nails is the scale of its quest. It feels like a massive, all-encompassing journey around the, as the English title suggests, Earth. So the swamp here is shrouded in complete darkness, but if we use the hawk eye that we picked up in the pyramid, we are able to see the whole environment. Again, like most of the combat sections in Earthbound, I don't have a whole lot to say here, but one thing that I felt was worth mentioning was that we're able to find a reskin version of Master Belch wandering around the swamp. He's now one of the standard enemies that we can fight. This is a classic but effective technique used by RPGs and many other sorts of games, where you take a boss from earlier in the game and make them a regular enemy later on. It really gives a nice sense of progression, you felt like you've grown a lot. I guess it's also worth mentioning that the swamp in the deep darkness slows your movement speed and hurts you as you move through it. This is annoying. You already move so slow in Earthbound that an additional hindrance is just obnoxious. We also find the wreckage of the helicopter that Pokey stole. As always, he's one step ahead of us, and curiously, the engine is missing from the chopper. He must have used it for something, we'll find out what that is later. The appearance of Master Belch's long-lost cousins is no accident. He's reappeared here as the end mini-boss of this section, as Master Barf. New day, new name, new color. He's fiercer than ever here, and it's a tough fight, but much as the Runaway 5 did as we were fighting the clumsy robot in Monotoli Tower, Deus Ex Machina Poo swoops in from out of nowhere and blasts Master Barf away with the power of Starstorm. With Master Belch or Barf defeated once and for all, we end the deep darkness by entering a small village in a cave full of these green people called Tendas. They only say one thing, we're shy. That is, they all say that except for this one who is for some reason braver than the others. The brave one's not strong enough to move the rock blocking our way to our next sanctuary, but the one next to the rock is. Unfortunately, he lacks social skills. He needs to overcome his shyness before he can help us. Conveniently, as we leave the cave, we get a call from Orange Kid. He gives us an update on his important work of unboiling the egg, keep at it buddy, and he tells us that he was looking to borrow a copy of the book Overcoming Shyness from Apple Kid, who was last seen in Winters with Dr. Andonuts. So, we know our next destination. But unfortunately, when we get to Stonehenge, we find that Dr. Andonuts and Apple Kid have been kidnapped by aliens beneath Stonehenge. Oh my god! At least Apple Kid has finished his state-of-the-art latest invention, the cutting-edge Eraser Eraser, that is able to erase the eraser that was blocking our way to this dungeon beneath Stonehenge. Now this is actually a Starman super base, and is the heart of Gagas' operation in the present. Okay, I have to mention something about this section. So, when I was recording this, it was my third playthrough of Earthbound, and I wanted to get a weapon called the Sword of Kings. The Sword of Kings is the only weapon that Pooh can equip other than his bare fists. Other members of the party can get yo-yos, and Ness can get all kinds of different bats, and Jeff has all these guns he can use, but Pooh can only use his fists or the Sword of Kings. How do you get the Sword of Kings? Well, the Sword of Kings is only dropped one out of 128 times by Starmen Supers, which you find in this Stonehenge base. Well, I decided it would be a good idea to try to obtain this weapon in this playthrough, and oh my god, I don't recommend it! I grinded this shit out for literally five hours. It took me five hours to get this weapon, and I understand that probabilistically that's longer than it will probably take you, but it is just not worth it. My first two times playing this game were totally fine without the Sword of Kings, and yours will be as well. I would just ignore this weapon, drop all designs you have on it, unless you really want to do and see everything that this game has to offer. And if you do, just, ugh, I still, I still don't think it's a very good idea. Most people aren't even going to be aware that this weapon exists, but once you become aware, it may trick you into wasting your life on this pointless endeavor. 
I recommend you steer clear. And you know, if only just to preserve the enjoyment of the rest of the game for yourself, because even if the Sword of Kings dropped for you with the frequency that you would expect, then you're still grinding so much that you'll probably be overpowered enough by the end of this process to trivialize the rest of the game. It's just an ugly recipe. I don't know why they even chose to have this drop here. What does the Sword of Kings, like an ancient weapon used by Pooh, have to do with this weird underground Stonehenge base? Is it just that Stonehenge is somehow related to kings? I don't know. I will make no further effort to understand. Maybe I'm just salty that I was so unlucky that it took me that long because it's not supposed to take that long. Okay, I promise I'm done talking about that. At the bottom of the Stonehenge base, we find the Star man deluxe he's the leader of this contingent of gygas's army that's wreaking havoc in the present he tells us that the apple of enlightenment has predicted gygas's defeat at the hands of ness which is something that buzz buzz told us at the very beginning of the game so whatever this apple of enlightenment is it's clearly prophetic but we don't know much more we don't know if it's a literal apple some sort of machine all we know is that it's put the pressure on gygas to get things rolling and so get things rolling, he has. He's kidnapped basically every major character in the Winter's region. So one thing I want to say about that, Earthbound's plot is generally low-key. There's not much urgency to the things that you do. You're just sort of drifting from location to location, exploring the world, meeting people, and uncovering sanctuaries and taking their experiences into yourself. But the Stonehenge segment is a clear escalation of things. We have a high-ranking member of Gygus' army kidnapping a number of major characters, and the threat seems pretty dire. So it's time to get moving on our side, too. We came a long way through this base, time to finally get that book from Apple Kid and take it back to the Tendas, and, uh, uh, oh, he, uh, didn't even have it. He returned it to the library in Onnet, which I GUESS IS A LOGICAL PLACE FOR A BOOK TO BE, HUH?! So we schlep our sorry keisters all the way back across the world to Onnet and borrow the book, Overcoming Shyness. Let's bring it back to the Tendas. After curing the Tendas of their shyness, we're asked to reconfirm our real name that we entered earlier back in Summers. Immediately next to the guy who asks us this is a Tenda who offers us some tea, which brings us to the sequel to the coffee break, the tea break. Now, in case there was any question if the first coffee break was directed at us and Ness, then the proximity of being asked to reconfirm our name and this scene should put that to bed. Now, I actually think that the text of this tea break scene encapsulates what Earthbound's all about better than anything I could say, so I'm gonna read it right now and then we can unpack. Like a great tapestry, vertical and horizontal threads have met and become intertwined, creating a huge, beautiful image. You may have cursed this never-ending journey. You have known injury and defeat, but you have struggled on to reach this place. Your inborn intelligence and courage have helped bring you here. You've believed in your friends, and as a group, you have supported each other. Have you ever stopped to consider how much your power has grown? Now you could fell enemies in Onnet and Tucson with one blow. As you certainly know, you cannot turn back. Gygas, the archfiend of the universe, is growing frightened of you and your power. He's searching for ways to end your journey. From here, the challenge grows and your adventure will take you beyond anything you ever imagined. You are drawing near to Gygas. Remember, when you are suffering hardships, your enemy is also struggling. By the way, do you know where Pokey went? When this cup of tea is finished, your adventure will continue. Your destiny pulls you in the right direction. Believe in yourself and press forward. Ness, Paula, Jeff, Pooh, I wish you luck. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. So the line at the start there about the individual threads of a tapestry intertwining and forming a large, beautiful whole, that is exactly what the Earthbound outlook on life is all about. It's about the little moments adding up to a sum greater than their individual parts. The tea break in general also serves as a kind of bookend to the coffee break from earlier. So yeah, on the one hand, we're literally told, look how far you've come, but on the other hand, it shows us while well, it tells us by giving us this parallel scene. Repetition is a fantastic way to build context, and the repetition of the tea and coffee breaks gives us a kind of scaffolding to situate our encounters with the wonderful and wild people and places of Earthbound. These two scenes, along with some other structural elements of Earthbound's design, like the eight-part sanctuary checklist, allow Earthbound to sum out to something coherent, instead of ending up an endearing but disjointed mess of wacky moments. And fittingly, to close the scene out, it ends the same way the coffee break did. The game wishes us luck. And with that, we're nearing the home stretch of our adventure. 
Another great credit to Earthbound is that despite all the reflection and ass of the player, it never gets masturbatory. Immediately following the tea break, we descend under the newly opened hole by the tendas, where we encounter a talking rock who tells us that the most talkative rock of all is hidden deep, deep underground. This kicks us off into yet another sanctuary dungeon that will lead us to our seventh sanctuary. The pacing here is pretty good. The game follows up its serious chat with us with some jokes and some lighthearted gameplay. Speaking of the gameplay, sometimes the game makes me laugh with just how dumb its enemies are. Like, sometimes it's not even trying and I don't even mind. Let me introduce you all to Fabi. It's so dumb, but it makes me smile anyway. Now, the Electro Spectre is a pretty cool Sanctuary Guardian, and really, the second half of the game has far better Sanctuary Guardians, more memorable ones than the first. In the beginning, we were fighting mostly large animals. There was a big rat, a big mole, a big ant, and here we're fighting increasingly abstract creatures and entities. It makes sense that the more remote places of the world that we explore, the more strange and unfamiliar our enemies will become. I don't want to harp on this point too much, but it's really worth stressing just how much variety Earthbound presents. The same game that gives us the new age retro hippie also gives us Fabi. After beating the Electro Spectre, we drop through a hole and come to what, in my opinion, is easily the best sanctuary in the whole game. The Lumine Hall. The walls of this cave, deep, deep underground, in a far remote corner of the Earth, light up and react to our thoughts. I'm Ness. It's been a long road getting here. Soon I'll be. Soon I'll be. Soon I'll be. What will happen to us? What, what's happening? My thoughts are being written out on the wall. Where are they? God, I don't know if it's possible to have a more literal demonstration of what it means to reflect. Ness's thoughts are literally projected on the wall in front of him. And after this happens, he sees a vision of his father holding him as a baby. Now that also is just so great. Ness's dad is not around like his mother is. We only talk to him over the phone. And while he expresses concern and interest in our journey, he basically just puts money in our bank account. It's nice to see that tender moment. After falling what seems like forever, we end up in this massive prehistoric landscape with dinosaurs stomping around, and the scale here is just so large that the player sprites are a fraction of their usual size. Everything about this place, how old it is, how large it is, how dwarfish we are in comparison, gives us a real sense of the scale and scope of the world that we're just a small part of. And really, that's what the appeal of real world travel is, confronting via experience the fact that the world is so much grander than our tiny slices of it are individually. The Lost Underworld itself is populated entirely by tendas and dinosaurs. There are geysers that are constantly spouting off that we can ride up to the surface, and earthquakes being this close to the center of the earth constantly shake us to our core. Now if we poke around enough, we'll find a small unassuming cave, and inside, we're granted a horrifying preview of what's to come. Well, hot damn. And speaking of hot damn, the last proper dungeon in the game is the Fire Spring. All the enemies are obviously fire themed, I don't have much to say about that, so I'll just talk about the area itself instead. It makes a whole lot of sense that after we circumnavigate the globe as we have in Earthbound, the last leg of our journey takes us into the fiery, pulsating furnace of the world. Now the last Sanctuary Guardian is actually a two-parter, which is strange, it's the only guardian like this. He begins the fight as Carbon Dog, but once you do enough damage to him, he transforms into Diamond Dog. Now at this point on my first playthrough, I was barely even concentrating on the fight to be honest because that carrot on a stick we've been chasing the whole game, find all the sanctuaries and take the eight melodies of our song into ourselves, we are at the end of that. What will happen next? We can only wait to see. With the Diamond Dog defeated, we descend into what feels like the very center of the earth, the Fire Spring. And there, Ness sees one last vision. He has the feeling that he's being watched by himself as a baby. This next scene I'm going to let play out unmodeled by my commentary because it's just executed so well. And I'd like you to be able to get a taste of what this moment actually feels like.
Wait, wait, it's slow down here. Back up. I'm not gonna let that scene go by without talking about it. It's my favorite scene in the game, and it's able to get me choked up every time without fail. So where do you start? Let's dive in with the melodies. This is the first time that you hear the complete version of your song, Smiles and Tears. Over the course of the game, you can access the soundstone in your inventory and hear whatever portion of the song that you found up to that point. So if you found up to Magnet Hill, you'll hear half of the song. So seeing this progress build over the course of the game and having it finally pay off here is definitely one major reason this moment stands out. After this, a much more traditionally arranged version of Smiles and Tears begins to play, as Ness curiously approaches his own house. The scene is directed very well, that it's able to communicate Ness's trepidation and curiosity with just a little bit of pacing work done to the sprite animations is awesome. Another fantastic little touch is how an extra instrumental layer slowly builds as Ness phases out of sight and through the door. Ness walks through the house like a ghost. We see King back when he was a puppy, just like we saw in our very first sanctuary reflection back at the giant step in Annette, where we caught a glimpse of a small, cute puppy. We then approach our own crib as our parents are naming us, Ness. God, how important are names in Earthbound? The very first thing that we do is name every character we'll control. We're asked twice, once to enter it, and once again to reconfirm our real name. Names are important. We are our names. They are the way that we differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world. Names center us, and we get our names from our home, from our family. By giving us a name and raising us right, our families lay the foundation we need to face the world with courage and understanding. Our existence is celebrated with our parents' favorite food, which will become our favorite food, the flavor of our home, of our life. Our mother wishes for us to become a thoughtful, strong boy, and it's the spirit of that wish and that upbringing that allows us to stand up to any ill intent that might cross our path. This is what our family gave us that Pokey's family could not give him. As the scene ends, we dive headfirst into the bowels of Ness's spirit and mind, Magicant. Magicant is the world of our mind. Everything within it is constructed from Ness's thoughts and experiences. We're told that every facet of human emotion is on display here, including an evil and violent side, but now we're ready to face it. Every avatar of our mind we speak with causes the world to shift in color. This may be a literalization of the many different lenses through which we can view the world and ourselves. The color shifts also serve to add to the wild strangeness of this place. Most everyone from Ness's past can be spoken with here, including a snowman. We had fun one snowy day. I melted, but I'm still real in your memory. We're also able to talk with Pokey. It seems like deep down inside, Ness knows what his problem is. He envies us. He says that it's having no luck, but we know that the problem is deeply rooted in the family that produced him. He asks us if we'll be friends forever with him layering back to the very beginning of the game when the police officer in Annette asked us, is Pokey our friend? Pokey, I'm sure, hoped that the answer was yes. We're also able to find Buzz Buzz's tombstone. He appeared earlier in the game, the game tells us, and gave up the ghost before he achieved his goal. Well, that's okay. We're gonna do it for him. Because we have the help of the legendary Flying Men. The Flying Men are the manifest forms of Ness's courage, and we're gonna need them. Because we have to descend deeper and deeper into Ness's mind, fighting enemies all on our own. We don't have a party with us anymore, keep in mind. We are in Ness's mind. Along the way, we'll find a version of ourselves who gives us the baseball cap that we lost. It's been referenced in the sanctuaries and in the scene that we just watched with the baby in the crib. Ness's cap has been a part of him since he was a baby. It's almost, like his name, one way that he situates himself in the world, so regaining this is symbolic. The flying men are able to protect us from enemy damage, much in the same way that we can have teddy bears take hits from enemies for us just in the main game. If you're taking the flying men with you, they will almost all certainly die. They can only take so many hits, and if you go back to their house, you'll see the tombstones accumulate. This is a way of showing literally how Ness is using every ounce of his courage to face the darkness that lies deep at the center of his self. We reach a little silver curly cue that teleports us to the Sea of Eden. This is the deepest our mind goes. Just like the big piles of puke in the deep darkness swamp area, the Sea of Eden resurrects an old boss as a common enemy, this time the Kraken. With how fearsome this enemy was earlier, it really shows us how far we've come. What lies at the center of the Sea of Eden? The Manny Manny statue. 
This is the manifestation of the evil part of ourselves. This is the slice of our personality that is open to manipulation, greed, and cruelty. This is not the same statue that we saw in Foresight and Happy Happy Village. That statue fed off the distorted hearts of Carpenter and Mr. Manatoli. But the only reason it was able to exert that evil influence is because those people, just by virtue of being humans leading unexamined lives, were open to this sort of evil. So we're not actually fighting a statue here, we're fighting the portion of our heart that would be open to that sort of control in the first place. Put simply, we're fighting our inner demons. And just further driving home the point that this is a part of ourselves, the Nightmare uses the same psychic abilities that Nest uses down to his favorite thing against him. After overcoming the Nightmare, Ness hears his own voice, guiding himself to Saturn Valley to finish his quest to save the world. This is the transcendental moment. This is what Earthbound has been building to over the course of the entire game. We receive massive boosts to all our stats, courtesy each individual sanctuary we've taken into ourselves, listed one by one, and true to form, the Magicant sequence ends with a moment of reflection. We flash back through each place we've made our own around the world over our journey, before returning to our friends, armed with the spiritual understanding we need to execute our task and be the world's salvation. When we go to Saturn Valley, we try to use the Phase Distorter to take us to Gygas, but it's not complete. It needs one more material that can only be obtained from a meteorite. Conveniently, there's a meteorite sitting at the top of the mountain above our house, so it's time to head back to Annette. Makes sense that our journey would take us full circle in this way. When we arrive back home, we find Annette shrouded in darkness and full of the strongest enemies we've faced thus far in the game. It shouldn't be a problem for us because we're sufficiently leveled from our time in Magicant at this point, but it's not me I'm worried about here. Our sister, our dog, and of course our mother are terrified because, oh my god, there's aliens everywhere! This is Earthbound at its most urgent. For the first time, we have an extreme pressing reason that we need to take care of Gygus once and for all. Because now he's attacking our home, and by extension, our family. Earthbound just got done demonstrating beautifully to us the vital importance of our family, so it makes perfect dramatic sense to have our homeland threatened now as opposed to at any other point in the game. In your bog-standard RPG story, the player character's home is destroyed by the evil army at the beginning of the game or whatever, which launches a campaign against the big bad motivated by revenge. But in Earthbound, we're sent off on our journey with only a vague notion of destiny and an eight-part quest to fulfill. Then later, after experiencing the world and confronting the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves, we come to understand what truly matters in life. Being a thoughtful person is what matters. Your home is what matters. Your family is what matters. Earthbound waits to introduce the threat to the player's home until the end of the game, after it thoroughly demonstrates through the sum of your experiences the philosophical truth that home and family are everything. Now that is a truly compelling reason to go after a final boss if I've ever heard one. So, after retrieving the piece of meteorite, we're transported to a mysterious place we only caught a glimpse of down in the Lost Underworld. A stretch of land in an endless abyss. The trumpets here are really haunting. Something about this place feels final and deeply wrong. Pooh's master sweeps in to teach him one last power, Starstorm Omega, one of the most powerful Psy moves in the game aside from Ness's own ultimate ability, Psy Rockin, or whatever your favorite thing is, Omega. Talking to a Mr. Saturn, he tells us that a bad guy kidnapped him and then escaped to the past. There's only one bad guy still unaccounted for at this point in Earthbound, Pokey. So, Dr. Andonuts and Apple Kid have determined that Gygus is attacking from this exact location, but from far, far in the past. In what is basically Dr. Andonuts' only serious conversation with us in the game, he informs us that we aren't going to be able to travel to the past to fight Gygus in our current forms. Only inanimate matter can make the jump back in time. This means that our souls are going to need to be ripped from our bodies and transplanted into robot bodies to make the trip. And even then, there's no guarantee that our spirits will ever be able to return to the present. Now, at this point, this is no deterrent to us. The gravity of our task is too clear. So we'll go, but that doesn't mean Earthbound is going to shy away from the brutality of this process. We're shown, or rather we hear, every excruciating bit of this process. One by one, each member of our party is drilled, sawed, and generally violated in horrifying ways, and their souls are relocated into robot bodies. The way this scene is presented is just great. You only see the character sprite lying down, and you hear what's being done to them. The ending of Earthbound is such a sharp departure from the tone of the rest of the game, 
but it feels earned. It's after Ness has transcended through the course of the game that he's able to tee off against a truly horrifying threat. When we wake up, we don't even get to see what we look like. We are right off to the pass in the phase disorder, to the final area of Earthbound, to fight Gygus and save the world once and for all. We finally see what's happened to us when we exit the phase disorder and step out into this hellish nightmare, the cave of the past. As identified earlier, the music here samples Deirdre from the Beach Boys in a truly innovative and chilling way. From the soundtrack to the visual design, this is an extremely off-putting place. We have no idea how long ago in the past we've traveled back, but I would venture to guess millions of years, because wherever we are right now, it looks nothing like Earth, or at least not any Earth that we've seen. And as you know, we've seen quite a lot of it. The changes to our bodies are disturbing as well. Aside from Ness's red cap, there's nothing recognizably human about us anymore. There's even been a footstep sound effect added where clunky metal is hitting the rocks. The enemies that you encounter here are miles tougher than any other in the game. Couple that with the fact that this stretch between here and Gygus is longer than any bit of gameplay in the whole of Earthbound, and we're looking at a real gauntlet before the final boss. Again, the design of this place is just so weird and unsettling. That you have to slog through it this long amplifies that effect for sure. After a grueling push to the end of the cave of the past, we find ourselves at a crack in the rock formation. A cave in a cave in the center of the earth, when the earth was young. This is the site of our final showdown with Gygus. The scene we're presented with when we push through is genuinely horrifying. A slithering network of tubes, half mechanical and half umbilical, these ropes twist and writhe their way deeper in. I'll address a commonly held view of Gygus in this room now. A lot of people have suggested Gygus is a cosmic fetus of some kind that we've come to abort, pointing to these tubes and his vaguely fetal appearance. I don't see it so literally. Gygus' true nature is too mysterious to simplify in terms like that, but the imagery speaks for itself, standing, among other things, as a perversion of life and motherhood. Ness's face emerges from the center of whatever this is. We're looking into the abyss, and it's staring back at us with our own face. But that's okay, we faced ourselves once before back in Magicant. Before we can even wrap our heads around what we're looking at, who shows up but Pokey Minch? The wisdom of the world that we've taken into ourselves from our experience has led us to one side of this battle, and Pokey's been led to the other by Master Gygus, or just Gygus, as Pokey explains. Master would be inaccurate. Gygus is evil itself and it is completely unable to control itself. It is wild and a slave to its own nature. In Earthbound's metaphysics, evil is not intent necessarily. It's a substantial thing that exerts influence on people. It's not conscious necessarily, but it touches people and they're seduced. This is true of Carpainter, of Monotoli, and in a much more extreme and terrifying way, Pokey. Just like the nightmare that we faced earlier, Gygus here uses our own attacks against us. He uses psychic abilities rooted in our favorite thing. But aside from this, and the general creepy vibe of the area leading up to this, this is a pretty traditional boss fight. We have the main boss dealing heavy damage, and a cohort, Pokey, helping. Also, just listen to the music here. It's about as upbeat and traditional you'd expect final boss music in an RPG to be. An intense chiptune riff that keeps the energy of the fight high. But this familiarity will not last. After we deal enough damage, the battle lets up and Pokey suggests you must feel pretty stupid to keep fighting without even knowing what Gygus looks like. He drops this chiller. If you were to ever see Gygus, you'd be so petrified with fear you'd never be able to run away. He offers to turn off the Devil's Machine, which we have to assume is the nightmarish network of tubes and machinery we've been fighting to this point, and show us Gygus' true face. So, isn't this terrifying? I'm terrified too. Gygus cannot think rationally anymore, and he isn't even aware of what he's doing now. His own mind was destroyed by his incredible power. What an almighty idiot. Yup, that's what he is. And you, you'll be just another meal to him. Gygus's true form is terrifying. He, if you can call it a he, looks like the essence of pain and suffering, a twisted face filling our whole field of vision with screams. 
This portion of the battle makes brilliant use of Earthbound's trippy background technology. Gygus has no sprite, he is the background itself, and he warps and shifts constantly. We're unable to pin down any true shape that we can wrap our heads around. Speaking of, when Gygus attacks us, we don't even know what's being done to us. The text reads, you cannot grasp the true form of Gygus' attack. This move, if you want to call it that, can do anything. Like there, it did nothing to Ness, it made Paula start crying, it left Jeff numb, and it instantly killed Pooh. Gygus is unconstrained, rampaging malice itself, a cosmically horrific being. We don't have the faintest chance of making sense of Gygus at this point, we just need to keep attacking and hope for the best. But in a way, Pokey is almost scarier than Gygus. Let's listen to what he says. You must be at the end of your rope. In this bizarre dimension, you're the only force fighting for justice. You're waiting to be burned up with all the rest of the garbage of this universe. That's so sad, I can't help but shed a tear. You know, my heart's speeding incredibly fast. I must be experiencing absolute terror. Do you want to scream for help here in the dark? Why not call your mommy, Ness? Say, Mommy, Daddy, I'm so frightened, I think I'm gonna wet my pants! Gygus is so alien, so strange, so mysterious, but Pokey is a clear and instantiated form of human evil. He is taking pleasure in our suffering, and that's something that we can identify with and hate. Gygus is the nature of evil itself, but Pokey, Pokey is a person, a morally failed person. Much easier to make sense of, and therefore much easier to be repulsed by him. On the on the other hand, I don't think it'd be accurate to say I hate Gygus. I'm terrified of Gygus. I don't know what it is. This fear certainly isn't helped by Gygus talking to us once in a while. Ness, he'll say, I'm happy. Holy shit. At this point, all we can do is cry out for help in the dark psychically. We pray as Paula, please give us strength. If it's possible, somebody help us. Our prayers reach Gerardo Montague, Dr. Andonuts, Apple Kid, and all the Mr. Saturns in Saturn Valley. In return, they all start praying for our safety in this time of need. The effects of these prayers on Gygus are devastating. His form twists even more horribly, and even worse, he starts to talk to us more. Ness, go back. Ness, 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 Ness. Of anything that Gygus says, the one that stuck with me the most is, I feel good. Good. It hurts. In a way, that's exactly what you'd expect. If he is evil itself, then these well-intentioned prayers that we're getting from the people around the world right now must be hurting him. Ness and Pokey's radically different moral character demonstrates that human beings are creatures capable of great good and great evil alike. Gygus is not this way. He is not human. He is just Gygus, evil itself. Pleasure and everything good is antithetical and utterly destructive to Gygus. It's like matter touching antimatter. Gygus and the concept of good cannot coexist. Paula continues to pray for us, and as we do, we're answered by souls all around the world who we've encountered on our quest. They hear our cries and send their prayers back to help us. Seems like your standard anime spirit bomb to me. You know what I mean, the classic trope where the chips are down, a true hero draws strength not from within, but from without to defeat the enemy. The prayers pour in, culminating in some final wishes from Ness's own family. Now this is when you'd expect our anime spirit bomb to be complete. All the prayers from everywhere in the world concentrated on helping our heroes in this one moment. But Gygus simply becomes more violent and unhinged. What happened? Who else can we even reach out to? Paula prays again. Paula's call was absorbed by the darkness. No, that's unacceptable. I won't let this end here. There's got to be someone still out there who can answer this prayer. Paula and her friend's calls touched the heart of... M? K? Prayed for the kids? Having never met them before? That's right. Paula is now reaching out to me, Mike, to the player, directly. We're being personally invited into the spirit bomb. Us, the people playing Earthbound. Hell yeah, we will answer that call. We've made it this far, 
By continuing to play, we've gotten invested not just in Earthbound's world, but more importantly, in Earthbound's world view. We accept the game's values. We affirm that openness, curiosity, goodwill, humor, home, family are things worth standing up for. In-game as Ness and personally within us as ourselves. Me, Mike. So I will keep praying and keep praying and keep praying. Mike kept praying. Only by accepting these values as important and worth hoping for with full sincerity are we able to finally defeat Gygus. The Gygus sequence is Earthbound's crown jewel. It resolves the game's mission of personal reflection perfectly. The game is just as much about us as it is about Ness, more so even. The encounter is so unique, disturbing, and legitimately well written on a thematic level that it stands easily as one of the greatest climaxes to a game ever constructed. Despite Gygus' defeat, Pokey is too far gone. He tells us that he'll see us again, and runs off somewhere, somewhen. Now, Ness will never see Pokey again, but players certainly will in Mother 3 nearly 10 years later. But that's neither here nor there. There's an extended sequence where we just look at the writhing remains of Gygus flicker and flash as it resolves into increasingly dense and horrible static. At the end of the day, I almost feel bad for Gygus. It didn't know what it was doing. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it knew what it was. All I know is that it seemed to be in constant pain and suffering, because it is pain and suffering. It's for the betterment of everyone that it and all the mysteries of its nature are washed away forever. After catching a fleeting image of home, we wake up outside of Gygus' cave. At long last, the war against Gygus is over. Our souls drift out of our robot bodies and find their way back to the present, reuniting with our real flesh and blood bodies. Thank God. I mean, it'd be a real bummer if after all that we just died. We say goodbye to our party members, Pooh goes back to Delam, Jeff heads back up to Winters, and it's up to us to take Paula back to her home in Tucson. But there's nothing saying we need to go straight there. When we have Paula in tow, we can either take her right back to Tucson, or we can just wander around the world until we're ready to be done. Tons of NPCs all over the game have new lines of dialogue just for this epilogue section. It's really up to you how much of this you want to see. I know I personally wandered around for hours just talking to people. Whenever you've had your fill, you can bring Paula back to her house in Tucson where the two of you exchange what can only be described as an adorable goodbye. With our mission fulfilled and our friends bid farewell, there's only one thing left to do. Come back home. Of course we're coming full circle, this is Earthbound after all. We face the world for all it had to offer, whether humorous or horrifying. We've met friends from all walks of life, all over the world. We've been through so much. Now is when we take those experiences back home with us. We integrate them into ourselves so we can be better. The very last thing we do is share everything we've experienced with our mom who's eager to listen. And that is Earthbound. I just want to thank everybody who's made it this far. Earthbound is one of my favorite games of all time, and I hope that this video did something to explain why that may be. Earthbound is made up of many, many tiny parts that add up to a huge, powerful whole. It can be hard to communicate why it's so appealing unless you are able to experience all those little bits along the way. I hope I've been able to do some of that in this video, but honestly, it's a 30-hour game and this is a 2-hour video. There's so much that I couldn't include. So many great little characters, so many little lines of dialogue that make me laugh every time, but you just can't show it all, it's too much. The process of making this video actually has been a great opportunity for me to reflect on what Earthbound is all about, and I think I understand the game better for it now than when I started this process. But Earthbound's not trying to beat you over the head with any one message. I'm sure many people could get drastically different things out of this game than I did. That's a huge part of the appeal, and I'm excited to see what your guys' experience with this game has been in the comments. 
It's a much looser game than most, it's pretty easy going, and it holds a mirror up directly to the player. All those factors combined means that different people can get very different value out of the game. Now, it may feel like an awkward time to bring this up, but I kind of have to. The game's not actually over until the credits are done rolling. This is the payoff to the photo man taking our picture through all the different iconic areas and moments in the game. All those snapshots are added to a photo album that we get to thumb through once everything is said and done. And honestly, revisiting this game feels sort of like flipping through a photo album. The game leaves such a strong impression and is founded in themes that are so close to home that it's really easy to feel nostalgic for. Shigesato Itoi sums up the feeling in his own voice pretty well during the credits song. I miss you. It's truly an unforgettable game. Now, it's inspired a great many other creators who have made quality games in their own right, but none have achieved quite what Earthbound has. Fittingly, to close the game out, the player is thanked personally by name for their role in this experience. Unlike most games, it literally couldn't have been done without you. You, the player, are integral to the experience of Earthbound. Much like you, the audience are integral in making this video work. Wink wink. Now thanks for watching and I'll catch you all another time. Bye.